Well, hello and welcome to the unofficial Unreal Engine podcast, where we talk about all things Unreal Engine and also Porg Juice. We're your hosts. My name is Alex Coulomb, and this is Jacob, and we are back for part two of the Unreal Engine podcast with our special guest, David. Hello, everyone. I'm David Lear, and you are seeing me holding up a glass of uh, wine uh, from Galactic Star Cruiser, which is the 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 the, the wonderful cruise ship experience uh, in in the Star Wars universe that Alex and I actually get to go and try. Um, so I just had to talk a little bit about this beautiful glass, which is entirely spherical. So there's no way to rest this on uh, the, on the table unless you have the prerequisite little holder that it comes with mm. so this is a, one of the souvenir mugs in the awesome cocktails that they've um served me on my faux birthday on this on the star cruiser so just want to say it's pretty oh, cool as a souvenir that, mug. that was a fun fact we didn't even get to cover on the first part look, look at that i'm so glad we did this all right part well, two well Hooray. look guys if you like the first part Make sure you like, rate, subscribe, listen, comment, whatever it is. No, you're back. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> and where we left off, where did we leave off, Alex? Uh, the end of day one, we made it through like 30% of the whole Star Cruiser experience. Yeah, but, uh, we got we got a lot to talk about, right? And uh, w- the last thing we spoke about, you had a, a note in three parts, and it was a story element. We're about to talk about what it was, that story element. So let's all right, let's get into it. So to clue everyone in to the, the rough storyline so far, and Alex, keep me honest. Right? So basically, we discovered that there is there are resistance sympathizers on board, and Lieutenant Croy is on board with the stormtroopers to sniff everyone out. And Gaia, the celebrity singer, Twilight singer, is also on board with her manager. So at this point, lots of things are happening. Different thread lines are overcrossing and overlapping. And um, so, 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 so there, is, there was basically a droid that, um, that was also like a physical actual R2 droid, astromech droid that, that's moving around as well. And by the end of the evening, um, it had to be disabled. Right, so because Lieutenant Croy comes in and it's basically like, oh, we suspect that the droid is part of the resistance. So there's a huge emotional moment where Sammy, the resistance mechanic character, had to give up the droid as a resistance droid and had to put the droid in clamps and basically to the bemoaning of the entire audience uh, of, of, the, of, of the Star Cruiser at a point. So by the time we got to dinner, everyone's sort of like a little bit of a downer mood. It's like, oh no, the poor R2 droid, which everyone loved because it's an actual droid that we get to play with, is now depowered or unpowered. There you go. That's what that's basically a poor droid. Um, so if you're watching this podcast on YouTube right now, you get to see that picture of the of, of the droid that uh, has been betrayed by Sammy, the mechanic, the resistance mechanic. So so that's the context for when we receive the note. We actually see the note is explains that hey everybody don't you worry this is just a ploy we're looping you in sammy is actually still part of resistance he's not actually given up on the archer joy this is all this is all just a ploy to trick lieutenant croy so that that note was a nice sort of like hey just so you know things are still on the resistance side of things don't worry things are according to plan did i get that mostly right alex yeah you get it so it's really cool. It was a nice moment for for especially for the kids who were like, "Oh no, Sammy, how dare you? How dare you give up?" Like you know, da, 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 to Lieutenant Croy, but um, it was all part of the plan. Sammy was definitely the the kid favorite on our voyage. I saw so many kids swarming yeah. around with Sammy. <laughs> from what we understood from the Imagineers we spoke with, right? Like basically, like different characters eventually they iterated. It. Like some characters end up being more the kid characters. So you yeah. had Sammy, who was the mechanic, who was also often with Chewy. So mm-hmm. when you have a guy with Chewy, you're going to have a crowd of kids follow you. That was, yeah. that, that, was, that was just the way it was, right? On top of that, we had like Saja, aka the Jedi type characters, like Saja Tyson, Tyser. Um, he, he, Tyser, he, was, yeah. he, was, he was also like a huge kid magnet. Amazing. So cool, the, the way they sort of planned this out. But yeah, that was great. All right. So by the end of the evening, um, so we, we got, we, we finished our dinners. We, we got, we got, the no, everything's actually okay. What happened after that, Alex? 
Um, I just remember everyone being real tired, but still staying up late. And some people went and played some uh, sabak at the sabak wow. table. And um, we definitely got a good bedtime story from um, our D309. Um, here's one of the shots from uh, the bunk there. Uh, where we could see space outside the window. Were there actually any missions that night, David? I'm struggling to remember if there's anything we could do on our on our data pads. No, I think by the time we were, by the time dinner was done, like a few of us had cocktails and I think we were beat. Like, honestly, I was tired, right? So I think we, we our crew at least, we made a decision to sort of sleep a little bit earlier and we were like, we're going to, you know, stay up a little bit later the next night. But I think by the end of the first night, we were just done. So I think, yeah. Yeah. We did get, so we were given so much great advice uh, coming into this experience from Catherine Yu and various people who we knew uh, who worked on an experience. The nice one we got was they say that the first shuttles to Batu leave at 8 a.m. the next morning. But we heard that there's also a bit of a secret shuttle, an early riser shuttle, so to speak, that leaves uh, closer to 7.45 a.m. And we're like, ah, we're going to be on that shuttle. So we did get up very, very early and went to have our uh, delicious breakfast. Totally was, different from all the food the day before. Yeah. So while while dinner was a la carte, like they served you a, a, a meal, like a, this this one's like buffet style. So you could pick your various um, breakfast options. So this is like lunch as well. Like lunch was also like a buffet style thing. You sort of picked from a wonderful spread of delicious food. So was there any Mickey Mouse shaped breakfast items? That's important <laughs> to me. <laughs> no Mickey Man, Mouse. they did a really good job like hiding away the Mickeys. But I'm sure they were there. Yeah, this is like, and I'm sorry, this is an aside, but Disney World, my favorite thing is the Animal Kingdom buffet, where they have Mickey-shaped everything. I, I don't know why, but everything is a, tastes a little better when it's Mickey Mouse-shaped, and, and I, I can't explain why. I, I, I mean, I thought everything tasted better when it was called um, Bantha Meat and uh, Shandrillin Waffles and things like that. <laughs> like, that is clearly just an egg waffle with sausage and egg. <laughs> but because it's a Shandrillin Waffle, it was just 10 times more delicious. It was 10. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just how it works. <laughs> uh, and and to, uh, to give a little context to my intro today, <laughs> I went to breakfast and I was like, pork juice? <laughs> like we're eating like the liquefied bodies of the little fluffy creatures from The Last Jedi. And it's like, no, 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 no. Pog juice, pog juice. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this got dark. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, yeah. Hey, I, I want to ask how I, how did it I, I we've talked a little bit about like okay, dealing with claustrophobia or the lack thereof, right? What was it like to wake up in this situation? What, did you have any interesting experiences just feeling oh, wow, where, where am so I? I want to illustrate a scene that we were in. Basically, you have five full-grown adults in one <laughs> in one bunk, well, in one cabin and one bathroom, right? So, so I think, and we were all like really respectful adults. Basically, what what happened when we woke up was basically like I was an early riser because I was like I need, I want to use the bathroom before everyone else does because I I feel bad. I don't I don't want to hog the bathroom, right? So I thought I was the first to wake up, but no. Um, Kevin woke up first, so he, he he silently crept out of bed. So basically, imagine the scene. It was completely dark, and then you hear, like, you know, someone's alarm go off. Oh, that's Kevin's alarm. And then Kevin's, like, just skipping into the bathroom. And basically, it was just, like, after that, just a little, like, I think a cascade of us just sort of trying to use the bathroom before the other person. But I think, Alex, like, you you slept in a little bit, right? Because I think, I think... No, on day two, I slept in a little bit. Gotcha. So it was not day, day one. Three, rather, yeah. yeah, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so, so basically, like, we we... Yeah, we were five all, adults trying to take turns to use the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, but it felt yeah, definitely the bathroom situation is you have to coordinate well. Um, but I think we all woke up that next morning like it was friggin' Christmas, and we were excited to go on our adventure, our field trip. So following what Alex said, like because we had the intel that we were going to get the earlier shuttle, because as you know, Batu suns were extremely hot, aka Florida. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that we were, you know, on Batu for like the, the right amount of time. We don't want to be there too long. So we, we hurried to breakfast. We finished our breakfast and we, we skittered to, to the shuttle. Um, and lo and behold, there was a shuttle waiting for us at 745. So, so we got to Batu uh, pretty early. But let's talk a little bit about the ride, Alex. Mm, the ride. I'm pulling up a um, now. 
There we go. Oh, so there's the... us on our show. Wait, wait, wait. So some... I see people on their phones. Like, or were you checking Instagram or like, were there things to do? Oh, no, 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 no. No checking Instagram. No, Instagram did not exist. Um, So they did it the same way the airlocked doors pods sort of brought us from the terminal to Halcyon. The shuttle brought us to Batu, and this was like amazingly themed. So basically, it was just like a bus with no windows, but it had all these Star Wars trimmings, right? So there was Wait, a so whole, you, like, you were actually moving, like you were on a an oh, actual bus here. We were on a bus. Oh, wow. What's a bus? No, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, not 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 bus. <laughs> oh, a, a I, I didn't realize that. I I thought this was like contained within. So you you, <laughs> you were moving, and you don't know where, or I guess we'll find out. All right. So, I mean, they, they, they explained to us that basically the shuttle was operated by a third-party contractor from Batu, right? So it was not like a Chandrillan style fancy, because Chandrilla is like meant to be like upper crust. The shuttle we're in was 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 operated by some some scoundrel type uh, from Batu. So it was definitely they, they themed it correctly as well. So it was a bit more rundown. It was more like the Millennium Falcon style. Like it was more like you know definitely in, in, not not luxury, right? Um, but it was a bus. It was a bus. No windows. Um, they played. They played the local music of Batu, which was like they had radio <laughs> stations. It was all really well thought out. Wow, I I didn't realize that at all. I, I I thought this was literally they had like an elevator that brought you back down the surface level, and they'll have some like you know uh, um, you know closed off area that I I, I didn't know. This is, this is quite cool. Okay, so you're yeah, in the so bus. Like, it's early. You you had your coffee and. Oh, I see. All right, all right. So, tell so, us about this. Im- Im- exactly. So basically, like they, they had, they it was a jet bridge to the shuttle, and the shuttle had to bring us to the property in Disney World Hollywood, Studios where Galaxy's Edge is at, right? So they had like a whole proper terminal station in Galaxy's Edge for when we got off the bus as well. So it's like we were we got out, and now suddenly we're no longer in the Halcyon. We we, we were actually walking through the halls of the terminal on Batu, aka Galaxy's Edge. So it was really cool. Like, as you know, I've been to Galaxy's Edge before. It's not definitely my first time, but it's the first time for me coming down as a passenger from the Halcyon because I was like, oh, wow, the, 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 it really felt like you were the Black Spire outpost on Batu, which is like the, 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 the themed area from when you landed. So um, that in itself was a quite an experience. So we got out and suddenly we're in, we're in Star Wars land, aka Galaxy's Edge. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and uh, I just want to set up how incredibly intelligently they tied this into the actual experience. Because first, you think about the cruise ship experience. Anyone who's been on a cruise ship knows it's pretty common to dock at like the island or something at some part of that. And you go off the ship and you go go do your thing and you buy your souvenirs and then you come back. So same kind of idea here in general. But then for anyone who's never been to Galaxy's Edge, there's two rides there. And those rides are totally cool to go on on their own. Uh, There's different spaceships. There's different, you know, shops and things going on. And yet... um, all of that becomes part of the story because you are no longer just a tourist going to say hi and, and check out um, this experience that day. You are on missions, as David alluded to, with like the note the day before. So Smugglers Run and Rise of the Resistance and some of these shops, these are all very important missions for you to do, not just a fun ride for you to do as a day out. So again, this is not cruise ship the relaxing ride where you just kind of relax this is like the active you've got stuff to do get out there and and complete your mission um uh kind of day and and i love that the fact that like you needed to go on smugglers run because you needed to get the um uh coaxium Coaxium. yeah and uh, yeah and, and david why don't you set up a little bit about like what how that all works and how that's all connected yeah, so they did a really smart thing. This is, I just want to iterate how important the data pad app was for, for yeah. all of us, right? So, so basically, at this point, by the morning of day two, the app knows exactly where, more or less, where which path you're on, right? So you have the characters with this Lenka Mock the Resistance or Wraith Cole with the Smugglers, like it was for me, or like Lieutenant Kor, like They'll be tasking you to go to Batu to do missions for them. And these missions incorporate the rides that the two main rides that you're on so going on the ride itself was a main mission but doing things around the periphery of the ride itself was also a mission so you had to talk to people around the ride so 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 so, so there was oh, wow. there was one i went on for instance like i had to check into the cantina because the cantina people had a, had had basically a message to parlay to me right so i actually had to show up and talk to a customer there and show them like 
something on my data app. I say, oh, hey, um, I'm supposed to show you this. And then it quickly gets a character because they would quickly notice that you're from the Halcyon because we all have pins as well. So we have pins that identify ourselves as members of the Hal passengers of the Halcyon, separate from like normal hoi polloi Disney World attendees, right? <laughs> So they would get a character and they'd be like, oh yeah, that's that's right. Go 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 to this place over here and uh scan this and 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 you'll be right on your way. And so 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 it was just like VIP white glove experience in Disney yeah. World itself and Galaxy's Edge. And we would check off like task lists. So so like for me, it was like the smuggler and resistance track. So we had to like scan boxes, we had to like follow a little narrative adventure as well on Batu itself, where we had to deliver items, hack into antennas transmit secret messages all in service of the paths that we were on which were for me the resistance and smuggler and and i know alex had different things because he was working for lieutenant croy yeah that's right so i need to go i like it's so funny too the opportunities you have to kind of work both sides be a double agent be like yeah. well i know lieutenant croy wants me to do this uh, i also kind of want to go tell the saja or lenko or Think that Lieutenant Croy wants me to do this, and all the actors are prepared for like whichever kind of direction you're going to go with all that. Um, some of it happens in the app, some of it is like, Are you doing that thing Lieutenant Croy asked you to do? and the answer is, oh, We'll get different responses, but then you also get to sometimes have those responses to people uh in person, which is always fun to see how they're going to react because, yeah, they want to know like whose side are you really on, um, because you you kind of have. A primary angle. I, I never quite felt that way as much as some of the other um, folks kind of felt like I had my Saja track and my Lieutenant Croy track pretty equally right up until the end, um, whether that was how the app was thinking of me or, or not. But it did make me realize that there were opportunities to like give information to both sides, depending on how I wanted to do that. Yeah, the, I want to uh, commend and applaud the design of it where you could do that, right? There was even a track where you could be a double agent, like Alex said, where you could be both on the resistance and first order. And you'd be like, all right, this guy's probably a double agent. So we're going to give them a double agent de agent ending. And the characters will sort of like play that up, right? So it's like, oh, we knew you were talking to the St. Croix, but we knew you also you were working for resistance the whole time, this sort of thing. Wow. So, Wait, so they, they had that possibility for, for you. If you were in Disney World, so you, you got there early, right? W were there other people there when you got there initially? So the hour that we were given is typically for people who lived on property. Like they get, they opened up Disney World a the little early earlier. hours, yeah. So we, so yeah, so we got the early access hours being part of the the Halcyon, so because we were in a hotel, it was on property, right? So basically, we could do the rides. At a time when they weren't busy, yeah. So we had lightning passes, uh, which meant that we could skip the line and go the VIP line one time for each of the main rides. So basically, like we were, we were set. Like you know, like, like if, if we, we as, as long as we made a B line for Smuggler's Run, which is a Millennium Falcon ride, and also B lines Rise of Resistance, which is like the the epic other ride, we would be able to sort of go through both within like the half hour. Yeah. Now However, those you aren't allowed to spoil because those are still there and I haven't been on them. Oh, good point. Okay. Okay. We will not say anything about that other than they're both extremely fun. One of them, you get to pilot the Millennium Falcon. That one I knew. Yeah. And as you know, they do this amazing thing. Millennium Falcon only has one cockpit, but how is it that when you go down to halls, you only see one cockpit, but yet the lines and lines of people, how do they do that magic? I encourage you to explore that um and, and try to figure out how they figure that out because it took me quite a while it's it's it's, it's quite magical yeah pretty yeah funny. so okay did did you did it break immersion at all when you land in disney world or were you just like oh my god i'm glad we got to go here like this is what i wanted to do while i you know like what what was the feeling of, of dropping down back in florida but i i mean we've talked about it a little bit but like you know, seeing Disney World guests and like buying a churro is a little different than, you know, what you were experiencing. I, I felt completely immersed uh, the entire time I was there because it all felt Star Wars. -y. Even the regular people who are just there for the day, so many of them were in like Star Wars garb that it all felt correct. The problem came when I passed a road and the road led up to the rest of Disney World and I saw uh, yeah. big friggin' Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> And like, it's like, okay, that feels weird and wrong. And, um, and, it, but then it also got me in like a spider verse kind of mode of like, well, you know, Buzz Lightyear has this relationship with Zerg. That's a little bit like Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. 
later. Wars, but ultimately, like it felt icky to venture out of the specific um, area that was specifically Star Wars. Right, because right, you have the rest of Hollywood studios like, that's connected, right? Right, that's right. You would you have the ability basically to inject cognitive dissonance to yourself if you wanted to push that envelope, but because the Imagineers did a good enough job of making sure that the entire Star Wars area mainly keeps the Star Wars area, as long as you sort of kept within the confines of the of Galaxy Edge, you should be fine. And yeah, the, the, no one's going to stop you if you want to get a churro from you know Tower of Terror or, <laughs> or nearby. Yeah, and and by the way, the um the folks who are working at Galaxy's Edge. They know because you've got a little halcyon pin that you are part of this group and they will play along with, you know, if you want to stay in character, if you want to talk about the mission you're there on, like they know enough about that to like keep you engaged and keep you immersed in that world for 95% of the time you're at that too. Uh, by the way, I just want to say how cool it is when you're in, doing some of the hacking missions and things like that to make like a giant friggin' boiler or a spaceship or something make a sound that like ignited this little kid part of that was so excited to like press a button on my app, solve a little puzzle and make big machine go warm. And I was so, it was so good. <laughs> wait, so wait, it was, tell it was, me more about it's... that. Yeah. What are you talking about here? So some of the, little so, so the missions, ads... yeah, go ahead, David, go ahead. I know, you, you do it. <laughs> Um, so, and, and this got a little bit mixed up with things that the public can do on Batu as well. Some of this is actually part of our specific mission. Some of it is just other things that are in your app that are available um, because you earn credits and like you can't really do anything with credits on um, uh, on the Halcyon. I do wish there was something you could do with credits. Um, briefly, I did a South by Southwest experience in 2019. change those credits for like a whiskey flask and cowboy boots and a hat Merch. and it was a nice so way to encourage that level of participation um but here at least what you got to do in, in lieu of actually using the credits was do things like hack into a control panel and um and i'll, I'll give you one example there's one droid or, or, or uh, sorry a person who's like you know what i sleep above um this restaurant and they've got this big boiler down there and it's always so loud and I'll help you out with your mission if you can just shut that thing down so I can get some peace and quiet. So you go and you find like the right control panel and the right circuit board and you hack into it and then you solve the little puzzle very much like the puzzles in the um, PlayStation uh, Spider-Man game that you have to do with like Doc Ock's lab. So you're like connecting little circuits and making numbers add up and you solve those and then like the whole thing shuts down and it's like dead quiet and it's like I did that and it feels really cool. So do do normal digital guests get access to this, or is this just for this experience? So, Some of them might. So every, yeah, go ahead. Everyone can download the Disney Play app, and everyone once they're in uh, Galaxy Edge, they can open up the Datapad app, which is a sub app within the Disney Play app. So those of us who are on the Halcyon, we get access to the an, a. a fort version of the app where we can activate all the halcyon things but you could if you were just a disney world member uh you know a typical disney world guest you could also just use the data pad apps to sort of hack into stuff into the galaxy's edge and batu um do many missions it's really well thought out like there's a lot happening on the app if you choose to participate in that now the problem came when the fort version of the data pad app for the halcyon meets the everyday version of the datapad app on on batu because suddenly you have like a new currency you had uh side missions that you could only do on batu which would be confusing if you were just a halcyon member right because these are intended for guests who are just in disney world for a day so you know i know many of us in our party got confused when we were like oh we're getting currency now we're getting like skins for the app now we're doing all these other missions like are these related to the pathways that we had on the halcyon or is it something else? And, and, and it wasn't clear at the point, like which yeah. were critical to our enjoyment on, on the Halcyon or which was just like, you know, Galaxy's Edge specific quests, right? How long did you have in total in Galaxy's Edge? I think you're allowed to stay there uh, as long as 4 p.m. They did say get back yeah. by 4 p.m. Wow. Um, but you, like I was pretty much done with all my missions by 10 a.m. So 10 you know, yeah. it took a couple hours. So, but you, I, I guess if you wanted, you could have gone into Hollywood Studios and you could have around all day. You could have, but 
but here's the thing you you paid good money for 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 the cruise ship experience and i think most at least for me like it was so freaking hot right like it, it's florida in, 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 in the deep of summer that i was ready to get back to the ship to get ac but before we go there like a few of us actually booked uh, a lightsaber building experience oh right before we go to the lightsaber experience david real quick because i just found these slides uh let's talk really briefly about the way they diegetically dealt with the fact that rise of the resistance breaks down all the time <laughs> yes sir so the first ride we wanted to do before smuggler's run was rise of resistance which um we don't want to spoil it for for jacob so we don't want to go to too much detail but it's one of the best rides period that i've ever been on um so there are lots of moving pieces that's all i think all i'll say uh, and so it's infamous for breaking down. So to to, to allow for that, the, the 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 data pad actually tells you when the when the ride's broken down. Alex, do you want to explain That's what it brilliant. says? Yeah. Right, because David did such a good job of like, because he's the only one of us who've been to Galaxy's Edge before, and we arrive on Batu, and David's like, "This way to rise to the resistance." And we're like, "Okay, we're going to be first in line," and we're like, just about to get there, and we all get our little announcement on the data pad. That's Mark like, Mark. oh. Suspect, suspected resistance activity on the outskirts of Black Spire Outpost have been halted. We will notify passengers when activity resumes in this area. Mm -hmm. So they shut down the ride under the auspices of like they need to find if there's any resistance members there. When really, of course, it's just like the ride's broken down and they have to fix something. That's a, that's such a brilliant way to handle <laughs> your, your, your something failing like that. I, I mean, to turn it into a narrative moment, I, I think that's brilliant. It's right. Yeah. Exactly. It's like, hey, uh, just so you know, there's resistance activity, so don't go there yet. We will well, let you know. Like, all of a sudden, okay. you're not that upset, right? You're like, <laughs> yeah, it's a we story were, moment. And then we went and we scanned a bunch of crates because there's crates where you're looking for certain things. And you're doing. Um, the only thing I'm going to say about Rise of the Resistance is I just kept thinking that it was over and i kept thinking like that was satisfying that was good and every time i thought it was over it kept having like one more thing and that next thing was like even better even better even better and it uh was i think the best theme park ride i've ever been on in my life wow. yeah. <laughs> it, it's such hype such hype um for for all for all your li listeners right here and, and and especially for jacob dude it's it's such a good ride i won't say anymore yeah. but literally everything everything alex said I'll, I'll give a pro tip, though, for anyone who's at Galaxy's Edge. Um, Smuggler's Run. So as David mentioned, we get a lightning pass to be able to do Smuggler's Run and uh, Rise to the Resistance once, uh, which is great because we get to go through it and not wait uh, for an hour and a half in line. Um, you can't do this for Rise of the Resistance, but in Smuggler's Run, there is a singles only line, and that is even faster than the lightning ride line. Wow. So I actually was able to do Smuggler's Run three times pretty much in rapid succession by going through the singles only line. And that meant that I was able to pilot every aspect of the Millennium Falcon. That was a coincidence, the fact that I actually got placed in a different part of the ship um, each time. But, you know, just a, a pro tip it? that that is the fastest way. What? Sorry. I said, or was it a coincidence? I don't think so. I, I mean, I was I, literally I was... in, a, I was in a different Millennium Falcon each time. And the person who was like putting me in a spot, it was a different person each time. So uh, total coincidence. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so to illustrate that Alex lucked out, I did not, I was, you know, I went there three times as well. The first time, you know, cause I've done it several times before. So basically you could either be a pilot, a gunner. So yes, a total of six bases, pilot, gunner, or engineer. And it's almost like in, 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 in order of like a descending um, sort of engagement, right? So as a pilot, yeah. you have a lot of agency in actually steering the Millennium Falcon. Like one pilot will steer left and right. The other person will steer up and down. You could dictate, I think, different pathways that, 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 that the ship would be on. The gunners would just be shooting things and making, you know, racking up scores and, you know, the amount of coaxium you get at the end of it will determine how much credits you get. The engineer, the poor, poor engineers, what we would do is just basically fix a ship. Right. So as long as you fix a ship, you know, you get more credits. And the first time I, I, I went, I was a gunner. The latter two times I was I was an engineer because, you know, I was matched with a family of like, you know, very excited, excitable kids who wanted to punt the ship. Yeah. Would I deprive them of the enjoyment? I would not. So I would <laughs> just fix the ship with that with the with the with the parents. So did you get to to do something different this time? So yeah, I mean, the first time I I went I went with Alex and, and our party. I you know I was the gunner, um, and and I was very happy to be the gunner. But the other two times when I went back, um, oh, okay, when I did the singles line with 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, separately. I was still a great ride. Just putting it out there. It's it's a really really good Unreal Engine powered ride. <laughs> Yes. Oh, and I have it on good authority that this is one of the only uh, public displays of Unreal Engine using multiple GPUs in a non like in display configuration. So this is actually a very robust and unique system that apparently required a lot of fixing. Apparently, when Smothers Run first opened, um, a lot of this wasn't quite working and the frame rate was quite bad. Then once they were able to utilize more um, GPUs properly, it became a very smooth and, and gorgeous looking experience. Multiple GPUs, you say? Yeah, multiple GPUs. Um, you will see it. It's such a great looking ride as well. Like for, for those of yeah. us who've gone on Star Tours, remember that ride, right? Like that. This is like a better version of that. It's a real time engine version of that where, where you could pilot where yeah. you want to go. Like it's not just see through, like sort of bringing you to like a pre rendered sequence. Yeah, wow. All right. It's good. We, we're, we're, we, we got to get back to the ship. Not yet. We got we got some lightsaber stuff to do. That's right. <laughs> so okay, David. All right, all right. So so basically, Alex and I got to build lightsabers, right? So this is really okay, really cool. This we is also cool. something you can still do. So I, I don't want too many spoilers or anything. I, yeah, I've okay. seen enough like videos online to know the general idea, but like l leave some of the magic out if you could. All right. Gotcha. So we okay, fine. So so we built lightsabers, which is really cool, and we get to like, you know, like. <laughs> activate it in a group and like sort of swing it around and and it's really fun like it's it's a really nerdy thing to do um so the, the my, my blade was not initially red so it was initially i picked green so it was a great color um there was a store um next to the lightsaber um building area the lightsaber workshop called doc endars where you could buy different kyber crystals which 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 would change the color of your of, of your of your of your lightsaber so I, I picked red because I basically picked a Sith style, you know, evil looking hilt. So I was like, I, I, I get to buy red. So I was like, look, I'll just buy a red crystal. And then um, in front of me were these two other, was was a couple who were, who were buying red crystals by the handful. I was like, what are you guys doing? Just, do you just need one? They're like, no, because one out of every hundred red kyber crystals. One hundred. One out of every 100 red kyber crystals is a black kyber crystal which is essentially the you know functionally the same as a red red kyber crystal but it was black and would sell for 300 dollars on ebay i was like okay cool well good luck so i just bought my little red kyber crystal and they're like wait wait, wait open it in front of us we want to see if you get a black one i'm like look i'm never that lucky but well, <laughs> sure so so a little crowd was forming so that the 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 sales the sales assistant cast member also had like a little um kyber crystal capsule opener so she opened it and she unscrewed it, and then bloop, bloop, it was black. And I was like, no! And <laughs> the couple was like, no! And then we started cheering and started giving me high fives. I was like, oh no, Like this is so cool. I don't feel like I deserve it. <laughs> like the, 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 the couple who like spent like probably hundreds of dollars buying like handfuls of red capricorns so should deserve it. And I had, had half a mind to give it to them, but I just like, yeah, I, I did do it. I should have done it. But yeah, I got a black power crystal. Yeah, we see so it. David, just yeah, yeah me, on you. Yeah, I can. So it's inside okay. the lightsabers. What I'm so going to do just, is it, while David's kind of pulling it out, I, I've exactly. disassembled my lightsaber, and I can show you briefly that. So you actually do put your kyber crystal on the inside of it, and then um, it'll light up. Although the light's not quite coming through the video to uh, to do the different colors. So oh, I know why it's not coming through because it's green. But then I can take <laughs> out my crystal there and put in the blue one, and then that would actually change oh, my wow. uh, my blade to blue. And there's great sound effects and everything. There we go. So this blurry. is an incentive already for for all of you who are lis who's listening um, to this podcast should just watch this on YouTube because you can actually see me disassemble. Yeah. The freaking so you can see it glow like basically like hyper crystals oh. like just glowing right there. It's pretty cool. It's so nerdy. I just. <laughs> yeah, I gotta do this. All right, so I'm gonna remove the the switch. And you can see right there is a kyber Ooh. crystal. It's black. And it's black. Look at that. It's insane. I can't believe this little thing is $300 on eBay. <laughs> there are crazier things worth $300, but oh, they're not as cool as that. Yeah, yeah, wow. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but basically it makes a sound when you put it in. It's really cool. It's very so, cool. So nerdy. 
Um, we'll be talking in a, a future episode about my, my time in Toronto at VRTO. But I do want to give a quick shout out to um, Ashley Huffman, who has constructed her own lightsaber that has no sound, but it has all these little haptic motors on it. And as you move the lightsaber around, you feel all the right vibrations of <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. Ashley, Ashley Huffman of, of the haptics, Ashley Huffman. Exactly. That's right. Oh man. I can't wait. I can't wait to sort of see that lightsaber. I got to play with it. It felt so good. <laughs> I'm so jealous, man. Cause that's probably more legit than the ones we got for sure. It was very cute. It was like a Yoda sized lightsaber, but it felt amazing. I have no doubt it, it, it probably feels super amazing. Like she, she's basically like the master of haptics. Yeah. Oh yeah. She had like a Mary Poppins bag full of haptic toys. It was wonderful. So cool. So, so all right. yeah, uh, we came out of there. We were super, super hot. We stood in front of like a wind tunnel fan to cool off for a while. Oh, do you have a picture of us holding a lightsabers? Is that what you have queued up? Uh, oh yeah. Sorry. I was just going to show like, this is when we all pulled out <laughs> our lightsabers. There is a, a wonderful theatrical presentation to the whole thing that, uh, as Jacob said, like, you know, it is still going, so we don't want to spoil it. But, uh, you know, there's some very cool moments where they talk you through, like, where they got all these lightsaber parts from and, and how you go about assembling the whole thing. And um, um, what's his name? Sa Savi? Savi's workshop. Yep. Savi's workshop. Um, he's awesome. And it was super cool. Oh, last thing worth mentioning is you can actually get uh, food in Batu. You're given, like, a free coupon code and you can order food on the app and, uh, the food there not quite as good as the food back over in the halcyon but still very very good i had this like still pretty damn good what, was the like lightsaber experience included in the experience no, it or... didn't actually... no. okay no we we should we, we shelled out um so what was it 250 dollars yeah. for the whole experience it's 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 a 250 dollar lightsaber plus a theatrical thing Oh, and yeah. uh, quick. So that's how to make good money. In the same place where you can buy uh, kyber crystals, they also have like, you know, replica lightsabers of all the different kinds that you can uh, also think about purchasing. And those range from $100 to like $500. <laughs> so, wow. That's cool, though. All right. All right. So <laughs> you had your lightsaber cool. experience. You ate some food. You had a great time. You said you were there for like three or four hours. But actually, we, we, we should maybe talk about this. Alex, you, you've been showing us a few of these scans. What were you doing? In yeah. The so I was using one of my favorite little apps called uh, Polycam um, to be able to capture some of these uh, parts of the park. And so basically, I would go through with Polycam, free app, and take a bunch of pictures. And then it would generate 3D models based on the data that it could acquire from there. Um, and that was super cool. So uh, in fact, you'll see um, that I've actually got a lot of scans from the experience. I've got one of our room. I've got one of the actual um, hotel. Um, let me pull one of those up really quick because I just had one of them ready. So this was the atrium right here. And I'd like to imagine that this will all be useful someday for like archival purposes. Um, like yeah. decide to create like the VR 3D model of the, the whole thing. <laughs> Are you going to be able to post links of this for, for your viewers yeah, to go yeah, explore? Yeah, we'll put links to uh, as much of here as we're comfortable sharing. David, are we going to share our 800 photo album or maybe just a couple selects? <laughs> oh, maybe maybe selects because yeah. I think we need to get permission from the rest of the crew because we're going to have their faces up there. But that's right. Um, Definitely fine for, for anything I have there. And, and But I think you should definitely share your scans just because they're so cool and so people can sort of take a look if it's uh, convenient or some way. In some yeah, and I encourage our accessible. listeners to import these scans into Unreal Engine and then mm. clean them up and make a really nice. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'd like to experience, if someone wants to rebuild this, you know, so that, you know, I can jump into it. I'm open. I'm open. Yeah, I think Same. a VR version of the whole experience would be amazing. Alex, maybe you got to recruit, you know, this cast to do, uh, you know, a, a, a VR <laughs> version. That would be pretty remarkable. <laughs> uh, the fidelity of scans that Alex has made, yeah, we we have the, all the environment set up. It's it's it's, there you it's, go. it's no no problem. All right, so tell me about the end of this experience. How'd they pull you back in? So this is a very interesting point of immersion breaking. Um, do you want to talk about this, David? <laughs> sure. So basically, we were all super hot, super tired, ready to get back to the ship. And then we realized that, um, you know, um, that there was no shuttle. But basically, when we got there, the cast members, uh, so, so just to explain a little bit, so the cast members are 
Disney staff, right? Whether the performers or not, they're cast members. And you had the characters who are in costumes, so they're your Lenka Mox, your Wraiths, your Lieutenant Croys, and you had the other cast members of the Sion, uh, Halcyon, Halcyon who, who were called a blue shirt, because that's what they were wearing. They're, they're the blue shirt cast members. Um, so when we arrived at terminals, we, we saw the blue shirts there just sort of waiting nervously. And we're like, oh, what's going on? They're like, oh, we will definitely bring it back to the ship, but uh, you know, you won't be taking a shuttle today. And I'm like, what? What's going on? So they sort of like break immersion a little bit, like, we will have to put you on an alternative transport. And just so you know, you'll be taken out of the story. You're not allowed to take out your phones. You're not allowed to, uh, you know, just pretend it never happened. Just <laughs> pretend pretend oh, wow. that you start suddenly transported back to the Halcyon. And we're like, uh-oh, what's happening? Yeah. Then they led us through an alternate back door. And that's when we saw the back lot of the of, of Galaxy Edge. <laughs> and I'm this not even sure cool. we're allowed to talk about this. Right. So, it feels very so, like, oh. It was like oh, like you know, like so. So, if, so listeners, if you're hearing this, I, I guess you know, pretend you never heard it from us. Um, but basically, we went out to the back lot, and and they very deliberately say you're not allowed to take pictures, you're not allowed to to video anything, uh, take the bus and get back to the ship. So it was literally a bus. Like we, we boarded a a Disneyland, a Disney World bus, and 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 and, and got back on the sh- on, on onto the ship through the tor- the the same terminal that we entered through the first day, and took the same entry pod that we did on the first day aka an elevator back to the ship oh, wow. but as you can imagine we can't we can't show you anything that, that we, you know that this is literally the back lot of of disney world like it was, at one point i think i think we're allowed to say this right alex yeah i think cut it out like we saw like boba fett like in a in, in a golf cart like you know getting ready for his next <laughs> you know like uh appearance uh, in disney world so it was that sort of thing it was immersion breaking but obviously super cool for us nerds who wanted to see all the um, experience design stuff that that Disney Disney have prepared. Yeah, that's yeah. way cool. All the second right. DVD folks. <laughs> All the second DVD folks, indeed. So, so, so yeah. So we got back to the ship. Um, the entry was the same 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 route. We took the elevator back up, and we're back in the atrium. And that was the end of Batu, which for me was a huge relief because it was getting too, to be too warm, and I'm not a warm day person. <laughs> Yeah, um, and uh, I, I went back on a different shuttle. I was sweating my face off while waiting for the, the bus. And I realized everyone around me looked much cooler than me. And everyone had been given these like soaking cold towels, except for me, I'm sure just by accident, because I'd gotten there after everyone. But I was like, who can give me one of these cold towels? And I felt a thousand times better once uh, I had it. And like, like David was alluding to on day one, like, you know, they have frozen grapes and like they really do have a, a great sense of, um, hospitality and keeping you comfortable. Um, but it, it's really a testament to how immersed we all felt that going back on that bus felt like really weird. Like, again, cool from a perspective of like, oh, we get to see behind the scenes a little bit. But from a like, I am in this world and I am this character and I am on this two and a half day Star Cruise. This is really strange. I'm clearly in Disney World right now and not Star Wars. Um, <laughs> Wait, and so- yeah, go ahead. I, I was gonna and say I, this was the whole sorry. day. Like this was this this shuttle was broken down for the whole day. It seemed so. like for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. And I just want to. So everything Alex said about hospitality, I just want to reiterate how good the blue shirts were. Again. Yeah, like it wasn't just the performers who made the experience amazing. It was the blue shirts who also remembered our names, who also um, were in character. Like they were custodians of the of the Halcyon, right? So. The fact that they were attentive, like they were super white gloved to us the whole time. Like the fact that they gave us hot, cold towels, cold, frozen grapes to sort of make us feel like a VIP in the Star Wars world was was just spot on. It was just top notch. Yeah. Yeah. And there were so many little things that you could also do that just made you feel a little more special. Um, first of all, just interacting with the blue shirts and the kinds of stories and engagement you could have with them uh, was really cool because they were like, almost at the same level as the actors, our understanding was that they had kind of like an 80-20 rule where they could um, make up kind of like 20% of the story that they're giving you, but then 80% just had to be like, you know, I'm a person and and this is actually how things are going. Um, so those all felt like little extra relationships. And also there was a cool little interaction you could have with them in the gift shop where if you said like, hey, what was the exact like password, David, to get the little uh, special? Oh, I, I get, I, I, I... So we're not supposed to give this away. Oh, no. Okay, don't. But give it away. But, <laughs> but but I guess because it's closing, I think we can. Yeah. So the the idea is that for the really really hardcore fans who have demonstrated 
that they are part of the resistance, right? They're given a special code word to sort of tell the crew at, at the at the gift store. So basically, maybe I'll keep I'll keep a mystery. So so, you, so so viewers, you can you can find out you know what the code word is. But there's a <laughs> phrase that you repeat to 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 the um to the to the blue shirts, and they'll be like, oh, so you are one of us, <laughs> and they will actually sort of like. Make sure that the entire store is empty. They'll even distract the other yeah. sort of uh, guests and sort of like shoo them out of the store a little <laughs> bit or distract them a little bit. And then one of them will sort of bring you to a special corner of the store where they show you a hidden panel and you, they reveal all these special pins. Like, you know, um, they, they look like normal pins, but they have a special mechanism on each of them, a different one on each one that shows the resistance logo, the, the oh, rebellion. Wow. And it's really, really cool. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll I'll pull one up from like from from from, from the background a little bit, yeah, but basically, it. they would show you they would show you these pins and like these pins are for sale. So it's again another way, to like you know, milk money from you. But I was all in. I, I bought every <laughs> pin. It was just really cool. Like you know, you felt like oh, this is a special moment, entirely orchestrated by the blue shirts to make you feel like you are special, and also you earned it because you are a true resistance <laughs> person. Oh, wow. Which again made people like me feel a little bit mixed because I sure was helping Lieutenant Croy a lot. But hey, <laughs> you didn't expect that he would have merch, right? For first order, they yeah. I wanted that. to say like, you know, how do I say I'm, I'm actually helping the first order and I want a special first order? And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he's biased. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. All right, uh, all right. We we got to keep moving. We got to keep things moving. Yeah. Um, we had a little bit of time because we, we were probably back by like, geez, noon or something. And things were really yeah. kick off again until four. And uh, there were a lot of those activities going on. I mentioned before, like droid racing. Um, you can see a little bit of my um, LumePad capture here. It's upside down. Um, I was filming with my LumePad, so it was stereo. So this obviously looks better on the pad itself uh, or in 360 VR. But there was that stuff going on. There was bingo. Um, we finally got a hold of the Sabak table, which was great. So we all got to play together. Um, who was really good at it? I feel like maybe like Dante or something was actually Dante was amazing in yeah. our butts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Marshall also had a good winning streak. It was neat. Um, they they tried to do this kind of um, projection thing where it felt like it was showing you your cards in kind of a holographic way. I liked the idea. It didn't quite hold up the way I think they were trying to do it, but this whole table was was very special there's only one of these so it was a rare treat to actually you know get a group of people together to play cool i, I just have to say that the fact that they designed a, a an entire sabak game that's unique <laughs> only to halcyon was pretty damn amazing like they they and they they not just built the rules for this for this game and for the halcyon but they built an entire freaking table for that and on top of that they bought they made merch so they made special sabak cards that are meant to be just again played on the Halcyon. What, what do they call it? Uh, they call it Coruscant Shift, like but yeah. Sabak Coruscant Shift. Like there's a whole name behind it. It was there was a lot of effort that went into this. Clearly, right? <laughs> yeah, wow. And I, I yeah, heard I mean, from the No Pro podcast that uh, Nick Fortuno doesn't think this is the best designed version of uh, uh, of Sabak. Sabak. So he is designing yeah. a new version that uh, he named during his experience the Halcyon Shuffle. So we'll see how that turns out. Oh man, it, I would play anything that Fortune makes. I'm sure it is probably better. Yeah. Because, yeah. Also, here's David um, getting the glass <gasps> that you saw him demonstrating a moment ago. Oh, and this is Audra. This is like one of the best cocktail servers um, oh, yeah. that we've ever <laughs> had in my life. So, so, so again, another testament, another, another shout out to, to how awesome the blue shirts were. Um, but um, she took care of us. She remembered all our names. Yeah. And remember all our drinks, and it was my full birthday. My birthday was actually going to be a little bit later, but we just called it my birthday. <laughs> and I got a souvenir mug. It was, it was just, it was just great. There was a, a great moment where um, Kevin had been um, down in the room talking to D three hundred nine and had to do a whole thing about like, oh, you know, just so you know, Chewbacca is on the ship, but like, don't tell uh, the First Order about it or anything like that. And then the stormtroopers came up as Kevin is relaying this to us. And the stormtroopers basically come up behind Kevin and say, like, have you heard of any, you know, uh, resistance activity on the ship? 
and Kevin ends up very uh, uh, sweatily repeating the same thing, <laughs> helping D309 with explaining like, oh yeah, I mean, I, I saw Chewbacca, the Stormtroopers explicitly asked like, have you seen Chewbacca? And he's like, I, I did see Chewbacca, but uh, Chewbacca was on a skateboard going out, you know, the door over there. It was so crazy. I only remember it because he was on a skateboard. And uh, to get that like stone-faced, blue man group kind of like reaction of the stormtroopers to kevin's crazy story was so satisfying and so good <laughs> so they played along start to finish is what you're saying and, and they, i should mention yeah. briefly how incredible the stormtrooper you know mechanics are there david you want to mention something about that yeah so i mean they, they have a whole pattern around this so basically like all the stormtroopers they, they're not actually speaking so they're all repeating voice lines right so what disney actually did was they 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 there's some gesture recognition through their hands and through buttons they press on their rifles that allows them to sort of string together not just whole lines but words to form sentences right oh wow so they speak through gestures basically and and so they would all sound the same they would sound like the stormtroopers you'd hear on on the movies they would not sound like whoever cast member it is who was playing them it would sound like a stormtrooper and they would have, you know, intelligent, like totally intelligible conversations that you could have um, through just voice gesturing itself. It was definitely going to be. I, I, I would, I would love to be a fly on the wall just to see them learn how to do that, like, yeah. or even just learn how that happens. But it's crazy. Like, it's, it's, it's so good. That's yeah. They do hard. such a good job of making it feel like you're having this organic conversation with them, even though there, there is a very strict limit to the number of lines and variation to those lines they can say. Yeah, you can tell like there was some stormtroopers who were probably less fluent, so they all could say they always just heard them say affirmative, <laughs> uh, negative. Right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's um, pretty interesting. Yeah, because part part of the part of the narrative with stormtroopers is that obviously they're all the same person; they're clones, right? And like that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Well, but see, that's where things get a little bit tricky because we're supposed to be between Star Wars Episode Eight and Nine. Um, and by that point, of course, we know John Boyega and, and all these other people are not clones and they're regular people. And I don't think there's any clone stormtroopers left, but yeah, yeah. we're, we're yeah. not talking about that. <laughs> hey, forget yeah. about all that. You know, I, I did post, want to think about the fact Wars. that this was like new trilogy. And... <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, what's so great about this is it is not leaning at all on like, you having to love like the new trilogy or even star Wars for that matter. Like these are original characters uh, for the most part who you get to form a very special relationship with. And as far as we know, you know, the person we met who is Wraith Cole, like they are Wraith Cole and we met Lenka and we met Gaia. And what's crazy, what, what was totally trippy afterwards, finding out that some of those performers actually play other roles. So you see the actor who's playing Lieutenant Croy in the Wraith outfit or in the Sammy outfit. And it's like, oh my God, like it blows your mind because you're you're thinking like, of course they can do that. They're actors. Of course they can jump between these different roles, but you identify them so strongly as the characters they were playing on your experience. It, it just goes to show how yeah. uh, intimate and personal the whole thing is. And to be clear, it's not like a Disney princess where you need to be a type to play a certain character. Yeah. Right? So the, the person who played Croy for us was this like super British dude, <laughs> right? Like, so he played like the, the typical sort of imperial sort of like stereotype officer that you'd imagine. But we also saw him in character as a Wraith Cole. And our Wraith Cole was like dashing, handsome, tall dude who's like a Han Solo type. But he could also be, I can see him playing a Wraith Cole, which is like a British dude type. Or a lieutenant. You know, like, so, yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's like, they, they, you know, they did good. I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure when they embody different characters as they're as themselves, like it's probably a different experience, a different character arc that they probably might have gone on as well. Do you think they take real liberties with the, with these roles, or or do you think? I, I guess it's hard for me to tell based on some of the stories. It, it sounds like it was all; it felt very natural overall, but it also sounds like they had a script to stick to because you, you had yeah. strict narrative moments you were kind of always meant to hit. I'm pretty sure that they had very strict structures that he needed to go through, but the way they played their character was probably open up to them. 
and the director, right, or, 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 or the direction they got. I don't know, Alex, I'm curious to take your take on this. How, how much liberty do you think the, I, the, the actors have? I, I think they definitely need to hit certain beats. And in fact, it, it, they're, the tightrope they're walking is even more complex than I think the average person realizes because they have all these other outside forces on them. There are, again, things happening every five minutes, and those beats need to be hit. There are equity union contract rules that mean like, you know, someone might be in the middle of a conversation with you and they need to get back to the green room because it is time for their break. And union rules say it's time for their break. Um, and right. then, yeah, there's certain narrative things they hit that they have to do in a certain way. But like, if you start diving into one of these characters' backstories, like they might have 80% of that figured out already when you're asking to them, but you might steer them in a direction that's totally new. And they need to be able to improvise something that isn't going to break any kind of canon or screw up any of the other plot lines happening, but feels believable and, and truthful uh, in the moment. So all these performers, like really, really incredible the work they're doing. Yeah, wow. Yeah, you never so, really feel jilted. Like there were a couple of times when I was talking to someone and they did like rush off very quickly and I didn't feel slighted. I felt like, oh, they have something really important to do, even though it might have yeah. been like a union rule. They need to go take a break right now. <laughs> they made it feel OK. I'm not sure if you noticed, but Wraith had a giant wristwatch that had a timer on uh, it. So that that was, I guess, for him a cue for when he needed to sort of pop into the next thing. But I did not see that on any other cast member. So I it, wonder, like, what was Lenka's version? Was it a pendant? What, 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 it had to be somewhere close by, right? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Huh. Um, David, I wonder if it is time to talk about uh, the heist, which you were a very big part of. This got started right around four. Yeah. So for those who don't know, so I, 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 I followed the smuggler slash resistance plot line, and I really wanted to double down on the scoundrel smuggler plot line. So I tried to hang around Wraith as much as I could. So that made me involved in basically all the all, all the secret missions that he could possibly give me, right? So um, this, the story context is, so he's Gaia's, he's Gaia's manager, but turns out that he's obviously more than that. That he and Gaia are actually on the Halcyon to perform a heist. Uh, so you might've heard something about the Singing Stone just now. Um, that was what they wanted to steal. So you're thinking, all right, so these folks are it's clearly scoundrels. They're here to steal a stone because they're scoundrels. But no, the, there's a plot reveal that they're actually stealing it to because it's actually from the Toilet homeworld. So they're actually stealing the stone back for Gaia because turns out Wraith Cole, Wraith Cole was brought up and adopted by a a, a, a Toilet family. So this whole this this whole like justification for being a scoundrel, uh -huh. which made it then seem okay to actually perform a heist on the Halcyon. <laughs> So kudos on the narrative part. The, the 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 actual mechanics of the heist were really cool. So we were divided into different groups. And we all had different things to do. As you'd imagine, a heist would would uh, you know be performed. The people who sort of do certain activities here and there. Maybe other people, the other people who sort of do other things. And it all came together in a really cool Ocean's Eleven style thing where everything worked like clockwork. Uh, people were distracted. Uh, a team would go behind the the, the 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 counter there and steal the stone. And and it, it was really satisfying to watch. So <laughs> you are part of it, though. So what was your role in this? So basically, it got to the point where, like, some of us were had to perform a faux proposal, right? So a couple was chosen to be a, proposed to um, to distract the crowd. Um, a group of us were tasked to tell everybody to pay attention to the proposal because not all of us were clued in to the fact that this heist was going on. Right. And so Alex, I was part of the group that... into this. No. So I really quickly, because so much of what David was doing, I did not know about. But I was part of this group where I was told um, that if I wanted to help Wraith accomplish his mission without even really knowing what the mission was, um, I should be trying to make sure the stormtroopers uh, stayed away from that area and i'm trying to get this video to play it looks like it only wants to play when i do this um so we were doing uh i forget what it's called but there were a couple sajo members who were going through like the meditation tai chi kind of thing and uh i was part of the group that was trying to convince the stormtroopers to learn you know this tai chi method as a, a means of distraction so this was happening uh the wedding proposal was happening i saw that over in the distance i assumed that was part of the distraction system but wasn't I didn't know for sure. And then David got to be a little bit more intimately involved with the whole thing. 
Yeah, some luckier folks were actually part of the the heist themselves, right? So we had like two 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 passengers who were dressed entirely in a toilet um, costume. So you might have some, I've seen the deep purple lady earlier on. Yeah. Right? So she she and another lady were basically tasked to be the people to steal the stone themselves because the toilets because it made sense narratively, logically that they would want the stone back. So so they were tasked to, to actually you know go behind the the the, the counter itself and, and to case the stone. It was it was really cool. So, so what were you doing this time? So, yeah. So, basically, we had to make sure that the stormtroopers were looking a certain way. We had to make sure that all the people were all just looking in a certain direction so that they could do that. So, I was just basically trying to, hey, hey, everyone, just pay attention to the proposal that's happening. Look over there. Look over there. So, it was a really small role. But, hey, it felt important because, you know, I just, you know, yeah. just yeah. experience design. No, I mean, that's cool. So... It sounds like up to this point, we've heard a lot about the resistance. Alex, you, you, you were, you were on the, the dark side here. You know, what was going on there? We were telling Croy about all the shenanigans going on. Um, I, I was telling Croy about what I knew about the heist. I was telling him what I knew about uh, resistance members on board. Um, <laughs> it's sometime around four o'clock. Um, I, I did not get to see this in person, but I heard that Ray was on board. <laughs> like Ray, yeah, um, Ray was on board. Like sneaks onto the ship, and uh, some people get to have that similar moment to Chewbacca the day before, where she just appears, and it's like, oh my god, it's Ray. And I just immediately like talked to Croy about it. I was like, so you know, you know, Ray, that that you know, uh, desert scavenger who's uh, become quite a, a, a meaningful Jedi. Yeah, I heard she's on the ship, and so. We how did he react? All this fear for the first order, and eventually they like properly take over the ship. Like they drop their friggin' Nazi banners uh, over the balcony, and they're like, "We are taking over the ship. There's too much resistance activity, and things get pretty wild." Um, I did want to show a quick shot of. There was this cool moment after the um, heist, though, where we all, a bunch of us, got to gather um, in like this little tiny cargo area, which was actually way too tight. Oh for yeah. People. And we got to, you know, just have like a big celebration with Gaia and Wraith and, and be like, great job, everyone. We got the heist done. There was a nice message in our data pad. And, uh, and that was all super cool. I should also explain at this point that only so by the second day, not everyone could go to these things. Yeah. You had to be chosen and selected. So some of us um, were only allowed entry by scanning out m band so they know that you know this is only open to us some experiences actually you there was a blue shirt who had a data pad who had an ipad and would basically check to see if you were allowed to go in before you're allowed to go in oh wow so some things were like guest list invite only right yeah so this this giant room with wraith and this sort of wraith ending was not a guest list thing only but others, which we'll soon get into, were. Yeah. Right, Definitely my, my biggest, the closest I got to feeling actual FOMO was uh, David's like, I had to go, go do a special thing. And I was like, oh, cool. I literally have nothing on my schedule right now. I've done all the other things. I've got like 40 minutes free. Why don't I come with you? And we'll see if I can be your plus one. And David right. did this thing and they just like turn me away at the door. They're like, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I was actually... And we were both actually shocked because like, oh, no, because I was expecting to go to all the special things that I couldn't go through Alex. But I, as you would expect, they were all gate kept by, by, by a person on iPad. So basically at this point, so to fast forward a little bit, like, you know, the, the, the ship's been taken over the first order. Ray's on board. Chewbacca's on board. They're trying to figure out a way to make sure that we can save everyone and make sure, you know, that the first order doesn't win. So at this point we have done all our missions on batu and we have like special minerals called coaxium and all this sort of stuff um but basically i because i was part of resistance i got i got a message from lenko mock she was like i need you in engineering and only you can come through engineering do not bring anyone else so i was like okay i went there with alex alex was turned away and i went through and it turns out it was just me and three other people four other people with lenko mock so it was like a private one-on-one -on -one experience and engineering was basically this giant room where you had all these like machinery parts and really it's just a well-themed escape room, right? So you have all yeah. these dials and levers. And basically we had to work together, like me and the other three or four people with Lenka to 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 hack the engine to 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 make sure that we can break away from the from the from the first order embargo place, whatever. Right. So we had to like refuel the engine. I don't know what technical thing we were supposed to do, but to do something in the engine. So we had to do that it was basically like a 15 minute one-on-one -on -one experience with Lenka. And it was so cool 
because it's like you know I had to like make new friends. I had to like learn how to operate the the, the engineering machinery, um, and it was a blast. And I thought that was like oh gosh, only me and three other people got to do it. But then later we revealed that they found a way to schedule different groups of one on one experiences. I was about to ask, yeah. yeah. So, but you had to earn it, right? So you had to have gone further, further, further down enough down the resistance path to have gotten this ending. Alex, on the other hand, got a Jedi thing, right? I did. I got invited to a special Saja thing. And I, I just wanted to piggyback on what David was saying there. They do such a good job of coordinating all these different things happening at the same time. So while one group is having dinner, all these other people people get their blendings and another group has dinner and then a lot of those get repeated but again it allows everyone to be in much smaller groups for something that feels special and not like you're just in a big crowd of a thousand other people doing the same thing um we heard that up to 360 people can do this experience and it never feels that overwhelmingly full like there's a couple big events in the atrium where you kind of feel that size but for the most part everything feels very tailored to just you and your story um, I also want to shout out on day one and actually day two as well. Uh, there's all these things that everyone does, like the lightsaber and the bridge training. The bridge training actually ends up being different for every group who does it. Every time there's bridge training, there is some special event that is happening that is making each of those bridge trainings unique. You are picking up Gaia or Lieutenant Croy comes in at a certain moment, or there's a thing that you're hearing about with Chewbacca. And so um, the Saja finale that I got to have was actually a little bit different from what uh, some other people had. So basically, let's see if I can find any uh, proper clip of it. Um, you go into the room. This is the first time I got to see Ray. And Ray is uh, there and telling us uh, how we need to help her uh, with the resistance. And it's going to be silly if I can't find a clip of this. Um, there's there, By the way, this is the, the day two bridge training, which uh, our special one had Lieutenant Croy in it. Um, so as the people who are following Croy and helping the First Order, after the First Order were taking over the ship, we're then using our piloting skills to try to help uh, the First Order commandeer the ship. Uh, that was very cool. I swear I was just looking at the Saja ending. But basically, there were two different versions of this because in our version, not only did we get to have this whole experience with um, Ray, uh, where we see a, a holocron image of Yoda and all that, but we... Spoilers! Oh, yeah. Yoda, that's fine. Yeah, Go. sorry. Spoilers. It was cool to see Yoda. Um, <laughs> so it would have been cool. cooler if it was Luke Skywalker. I'm happy for Yoda. Here we go. So very private. You know, not that many of us. Here's Rey. Um, here's our, our now unshackled um, droid who is here to, to display this message. Um, there's this force moment. Uh, they make it very theatrical. You close your eyes as the lights dim and you don't see the like plexiglass panel, panel coming up to do this Pepper's ghost illusion to make everything uh, happen. Um, Ray cool. has this great moment with like each of you and you have this like eye contact. And then what happened in ours, which is different from the other little private moments where Ray essentially, I'm sure had to repeat exactly the same scene is we follow Ray out and then Ray has a confrontation with Lieutenant Croy in the hallway and actually has wow. to do a Jedi mind trick on him to make him forget that she was there. And you're like, oh, wow, I guess Lieutenant Croy, uh, not not that strong of a mind there. It was so easy for her to do a Jedi mind trick on him. And uh, oh, that's, that's so cool. cool. Saja ending. Some people got to have a, uh, another Saja a special and where they got to go out into like the rock garden and actually make those rocks um levitate those were with the that's, Saja, not with ray and that one that's insane it sounded like it was amazing i just want to also call out that so bridge bridge training you, you wonder why do they give you bridge training right so it's super clever so everyone like alex says when you go for bridge, tra bridge training is actually a narrative event like whether you're whether or not you're picking guy up whatever um, but it's also in preparation for a finale that everyone gets through, gets at the, at the, at the second yeah. end of the second day. So everyone, at one point, will have to check into the bridge, um, depending on how far down a path you've gone, whether it's with the resistance, whether it's with Croy, or whether it's with um, uh, Wraith Cole. And at that point, when you go into the bridge, a narrative event happens, and then you are tasked to operate the bridge. So all the training you had on the first day is now being used on the second day. And it pays off. It's just super satisfying to sort of yeah. see you. So on the first day, you do it with your friends, right? Because you're going as a group. On the second day, you are all split up. So you are expected to sort of make new friends and operate, you know, things differently with different people. So at that point, I mean, I think we lucked out where we ended up going to the same thing together, Alex. I know a lot. We ended up doing the right thing 
all at once. But I can imagine a separate party where they, you know, one person's doing a Croy, a Lieutenant Croy Bridge event, and the others are doing like a Wraith event or a resistance or a resistance event. Right. So it's just like it, it, it's it's just really a masterpiece in design uh, for, for 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 experience design. So I'm just in awe. What were your experiences then? Let's get into it. Like, uh, what was the finale to the second day? So the bridge experience itself was i can't remember alex what happened we were helping wraith basically well i wasn't on the wraith bridge experience i, I was on the lieutenant croy bridge experience i think oh you were kevin or dante was with you for that one correct so kevin and dante was with me but i can't remember now but basically we yeah. had to help Wraith through something and halfway through we would see oscar isaac like basically we were we were helping to, to, to break the i think the halcyon out of the 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 the, the blockade that we were in so we had to like, commandeer past like TIE fighters and stuff, and we had to shoot down TIE fighters. And um, Oscar Isaac sort of appears, and he's like, follow me. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure you get out of here. And it, became, it becomes this entire chase sequence. C-3PO shows up. It's like, wow, it's like a cameo experience where you get to see all your favorite characters from movies. It's pretty cool. cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and it's worth noting that um, our whole group, we all did our bridge training together on the first day. So it's kind of neat that we all had these other kinds of paths that we used our training for on the second day, um, like helping Lieutenant Croy um, blow things out of the sky. Oh, and I just remembered actually the, the cool moment of what happened with the bridge training with Croy or the, the finale here was that um, the First Order decides to actually blow up the Halcyon and he's like, no, really? like, please don't. I'm here and I, I've got everything covered. <laughs> and they're basically like, no, Croy, you failed your mission. Like, we just got to blow up the whole thing. So then even though we are ostensibly, you know, there to help the First Order, we end up fighting off um, the First Order and these Star Destroyers and everything to stop them from blowing up the ship. So it's kind oh, of like a cool. cool redemption arc for all of the, those of us who chose the uh, the dark side here. <laughs> so did you shoot down TIE fighters as well? Like you basically had so. that. Yeah, the whole thing is a little bit of a blur, but it was it was great because once again, you're like rushing from station to station and trying yeah. to like uh, frantically do whatever the different things are. By the way, my favorite thing in the bridge was basically the the VR game, Keep Talking and No One Explodes, where you have this big panel of all these different puzzles. Every panel is different. It's like, hit these switches, turn off these lights, move these dials, and like you need to get things to match in a certain way in order to um, you know stop things from happening or make things happen. For everyone out there who loves fidget spinners or just <laughs> yeah. fidget gadgets, this is basically that, but at scale. It was so fun. Okay, Here's so... A, a quick at just what that looked like a little oh, bit wow. on the bridge. So Croy's like, you know, yelling at us all to do different things. Let me try turning on the volume for a second and see if we hear anything. Trunks, Starwood, weapon stations. Exchange positions with Starwood system stations. And real front port side stations. Exchange positions with port system stations. Oh, yeah. So, that's just the part where we swapped where yeah. what we were doing on the ship. Yeah. And that's the voice of the ship's computer, just so you know. Like the ship's computer right. was the diegetic in instructor telling us what to do in the absence of a cast member. Yeah. Um, and here's a quick quick peek. Oh, it's not playing from there. Um, a quick peek at what was happening inside um, the room with Yoda, if we're going to see it. Oh, you recorded it? Yeah. You know, with my Ray-Bans, with my eyes closed. Here we go. The whole room goes dark. You're supposed to have your eyes closed. I'm just recording my right hand. And then I'll pop on my stuff. Look at that. Obviously, seeing a training video of it is the same power as, you know, seeing there in person. But there's Yoda. Oh, this draft. Strong. Wow, that's so cool. Neat. <laughs> so, I just for the record, I did not get this experience because I got the resistance escape room engineering thing already. But I'm super jealous. I wish I saw Yoda. That's cool. Yeah, it was cool. Um, such a great, great variety of different things going on. I, I just couldn't believe how, um, I want to say, like how complete the whole thing felt. It was very, very gestalt, yeah. very, um, uh, there's another word for like complete work where like every little detail and nuance is, um, is considered. And they did such a good job of that. And then, uh, yeah, uh, do we did did we do dinner before the finale? I think we did dinner before the finale. We did right? a Yeah, we did dinner, and then the finale, so what was cool about dinner on this we, night, David? So this dinner was even fancier than the first night. So we thought our first night couldn't get fancy enough. Instead of like a la carte, um, sort of, I mean, dinner served 
a dinner service like they had a whole orchestration a whole choreography of like all these servers sort of so so a big booming voice would come on announcing the meal and then the servers would come out with the, with the meals and, and, and to put them on our tables versus the first night where they would just serve it themselves right so it felt like a like i guess an elevated dining experience and the food was also like i guess a, a level up um, it wasn't just the stuff we tried on the first day. It, it was completely reimagined based on the different worlds of Star Wars. So, like they had something from Mustafar, something from Coruscant, something from another planet. I can't remember, but it was all themed really well. And again, all extremely, extremely delicious. Um, I have to say again, the bantha meat, the, the <laughs> AKA beef short rib is some of the best I've ever had. And it's consistently amazing. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, again, on the note of accessibility, um, Kevin, vegetarian, has been for a long time, and Kevin got these special meals, like the same number of courses and everything as us, but uh, special kind of vegetarian option meals, which I felt that Kevin was willing to share with me. So I got to try, uh, you know, a total of like eight or nine different meals over the course of that uh, evening. It was also good. I, 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 I'm I looking at all this. is making me hungry. I, I think after, after this recording, I'm just going to get some more food. Because oh. Look at that. Look at that freaking okay. dessert. <laughs> all right. So let's, let's get, let's get to the, the meat here though. You finished yeah, so dinner. We briefly skipped the uh, Gaia acoustic concert. What was happening during the acoustic concert, David? Do you remember? I, I don't remember at all. I think we were busy. I think we we had other things going on, right? Like we had, um, Gosh, was it a heist? I was. I was after... remember if that was actually part of the heist. Um, yeah, it might have been just before the heist. I, I can't remember now. So Man. here's um just this is one of our data pads. So that our schedule would would look different for everyone. Uh, acoustically, Gaia was from seven fifteen to seven forty five. So right before dinner. So it was after the heist. Um, it was after the heist. Maybe, yeah. yeah, but I I feel like there was like plot beats in there as well, though I can't quite remember them. <laughs> I can't remember as well. I, I guess it was like probably the 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 D plots of the um, the romance plots, right? Like between um, Gaia's <laughs> backup dancer and this other guy who was also a singer. Yeah, yeah. Can't remember his name. Um, that just shows how little I talked to him. That's terrible. What was his name? Wow, I can't believe I'm blanking on that. I know. By the way, but, anyone who uh, listens to the No Pro podcast about this, listen till the very end because you get to hear Noah Nelson. Um, improvise a Star Wars language song singing with the uh, the guitar guy there. And it was actually... Really? So, yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Man, I think going on a trip with the No Pro people is a trip in itself above going to the Star, the Star Cruiser. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's get to the finale. Let's go to the finale. Let's do it. I'm trying to find a, a good spot. But basically, what we can give the short version, and I think I think yeah. anyone who's listening to this understands that like the direct plot line that wasn't the most important thing to David and I. The plot line is there; it's a good reason to like keep your your body and your mind moving. But it really is about these conversations, these relationships, these connections, these kind of spectacle moments that just make the whole thing feel um, so so unique, so special, so communal. Um, it's it's really quite something. So of course. Um, in the end, you have what you must have in a Star Wars thing, uh, a big blue beam shooting from the sky. No, that's Marvel. In here, you get to have a, star a lightsaber fight between not just <laughs> not just Rey, which I guess would be her fighting by herself, but who shows up on the ship to fight Rey. But Adam Driver. I mean, Adam Driver. Kylo Ren. Yes, um, there we go. So at this point, we get to see the really cool retractable lightsaber oh, yeah, um, that some of you might have seen um, in, in videos. But basically, Ray wields a retractable lightsaber. And you can sort of see her switch it out uh, with a prop, prop saber at one point. But the fact that the, the moment when she turns it on is just kind of mind-blowingly awesome. Now, the yeah. YouTube videos out there, you can Google to sort of see that. <laughs> um, but it's just really cool to think that, you know, Imagineers that created the lightsaber that retracts, right? So there's a whole lightsaber battle between her and Kylo Ren. Uh, spoiler alert, I mean, good guys win. <laughs> Kylo Ren loses. But they have this really... Basically, it's like... A, the, the, the pyrotechnics, right? There, there's sparks. There are, there, 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 there's, a, there's a chandelier that falls. It's, it's, like, it's almost like they, they borrowed from freaking Phantom. Like, you know, it, it's, it's like they, they had all these proper stage theatrical moments that made it feel like a proper finale. 
Um, I would say that it, it's it's definitely a highlight uh, for the show. But again, taking a step back, going to what Alex said though, what was the best part for me wasn't the finale. It wasn't the the the, the food as much as I love the food. It was the fact that and if you were listening, if you're listening to this podcast, I just just know this. Like if you, for me, if you just can remember one thing f- from this entire podcast is that this experience made you feel special. Yeah. Like they, they, they had all the right ingredients that made it feel like you mattered in this Star Wars universe. They had all the tricks in the book to, that, that, that made you feel like you, it, was, it, was, it was your Star Wars story. And it wasn't just because of this large narrative. It wasn't just because of all the pyrotechnics and all the special effects. Or it wasn't even just because of the good food or the great cast members. It was a combination of everything, the gestalt. That, that Alex is alluding to. I, I wish I could find a better word for it, but it's... Yeah. So I think, I think it's a good... Sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to ask, like, so in, in this in the photos you're showing and, and in the photos you have been showing, you know, kind of all this activity happens up on this balcony, right? Um, or, or it seems like it's on this wraparound balcony that kind of happens above you. It's like the stage, right? Yep. Yeah. How did was it at all disengaging to have it happen like over there, whereas like the rest of the activity you were in was very much in front of you? It seemed. Yeah. Great question. Uh, there definitely were some parts, especially on the side balconies, where you just could not see anything going on. So some sight lines were not ideal. Usually, when something was uh, front and center, that was okay, and it allowed them to do a lot of things that they just couldn't do if there were, you know, audience members. violence than the films like there's a lot of them like slamming each other's heads into the railing and there's a lot more yeah. choking going on and it was like a little more disturbing of a fight than i was expecting but you know uh <laughs> two very talented performers uh doing their thing and by the way there was an extra saja who who we noticed who was there on day two <laughs> extensively they were picked up uh, on batu all makes sense within the story uh this is saja grayson but it's like, oh, hey, no one saw Saja Grayson during the Kylo Ren fight. Huh. Usually when you have an huh. actor, you're going to have them for an eight hour shift. I wonder who played Kylo Ren. But it was all great uh. and very well integrated into the whole experience. Um, one thing I want to mention, too, is yeah. after <laughs> after everything ends, the, the whole main plot is over. Uh, back in the bridge room, we get to watch someone play with the uh, Unreal Engine Marketplace fireworks effect <laughs> <laughs> whole finale with the credits music. And the unfortunate thing for me was that I realized at this moment was they're playing the Star Wars credits music. And I realized how many people work on a piece like this who never get credit for it. You never see their name. Yeah. And for this brief moment, I thought like, are we going to see the like 800 people who worked on this piece? And unfortunately not. That's just not a thing you see in immersive theater. But um, if only, if only. I would feel that it would actually add to the experience to have the proper Star Wars credit, 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 the blue blue credits fade in and out because it felt like the right moment for it, it right? Everyone's looking at the screen. You could still have the fireworks. You could still use the Unreal Engine as a store at fireworks. It would be a great time to have the credits right there. I felt it was kind of empty, honestly, with just seeing the fireworks. It didn't, I was okay for the non diegesis of credits coming out because actually it would be more holistically Star Wars for me. Despite the non diegesis Yeah. And, just and saying. you're kind of you're kind of ending the story um, at that moment, the primary story. And what you saw after that, because by that point it's like, I don't know, 9 p.m. at night or something like that. A lot of people who were in character the entire time you'd seen them up to that point, they felt comfortable kind of relaxing at that point and being like, Hey, my name's James. I've done the experience three times before. I know I was playing yeah. like a bounty hunter, like now we can just chat. And that was really cool. So you know, I think if we had all been like kicked out of the experience right after that finale, it would have been a little overwhelming. I think it would have been kind of traumatic. Um, people like to talk about transformative Definitely. experiences in theater. Uh, sometimes a transformative experience can be traumatic if it's not properly uh, uh, curated and handheld. And so some people were like, oh, yeah, why does it keep going after that finale is over? Because you don't leave until the next day. And I think it is absolutely the right decision to let you like come down off of that crazy experience you've had relax process it talk to other people um have that night you know we we were in the bar until the bar closed not because we're alcoholics but because we're having such great conversations with everyone and then um and then you get to you know kind of sleep through the thing and then leave the next morning 
But um, yeah, David, any observations about how it felt between the story ending and, you know, the rest of the night and then and then how we wrap things up? Man, I think you 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 nailed all the great pieces though. I mean, it's just it's just basically the psychological. You described the psychological anti room, right? And that's what they built yeah. the space for. And it's very deliberate. You could feel that because it's like at the end of every conference, this is a conference drop, right? Yeah. What they call a LARP drop LARP or drop. Like a conference drop. I I I I definitely started feeling that the minute the credits rolled. I was like, oh, this is the end. But hey, I'm still here for like another eight more hours. I'm gonna hang out with my friends, my new friends, my old friends. We're just gonna have a drink at the cantina. And sure, you're not in character anymore, but it doesn't matter. We can talk about the experience. Like some of the best things about going to watch a show is talking to your friends about it afterwards. And he gave us yeah. a space for that. They kept the they kept the lounge, the cocktail lounge, the cantina. It's not a cantina, it's a lounge, it's a sublight lounge open to allow people to do that. And I'm grateful that they did because that's how I guess we decompressed from our LARP drop. Well, that's how the how, how the credits kept rolling, right? I mean, it sounds like, it's, it, I mean, even on this podcast, right? We, we've been talking for a long time now, but there's been a bunch of moments here where it's been, oh, well, I didn't know you did that. Yeah, I, you know, oh, I didn't know that happened and so on and so forth. It sounded like at that point, it's, there was, there must've been so much to talk about. So, so much. I mean, already, I'm sure you can tell, like, we're blanking on things. Like, <laughs> and I think we've just like, I think we've really just covered 20% of like, oh, yeah. what we've actually seen. There's a lot more like, I, you know, like going through, I, I just, I'm just watching Alex go through all the photographs. There's so much like this <laughs> freaking, Alex, you got to talk about this. <laughs> Narkina five prisoner sequence. Yeah. So some people, of course, they plan out a lot of things before they actually come here. And uh, Elizabeth, my wife, uh, uh, had bought like costumes to kind of share with anyone who wanted to use them. One of them was the Narkina 5 prisoner outfit from Andor, which by the way, super comfy outfit, basically feels like pajamas. And I was the only person who was wearing this the entire, you know, three days as like my, my costume. Um, but then uh, the, the woman in the red hair here, she came up to me after like the first day and was like, oh, are you going to, you know, wear that for our photo shoot on the last day? And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But apparently she'd organized with a bunch of people like to bring an Arkina 5 prison uniform. And then we did this like little photo shoot of, um, uh, you know, uh, on program and one way out. And we just had a, a great time kind of making this whole wow. thing feel as Andory as possible. And there were so many people just having such a ball with this thing. But again, it goes, goes to show that the ante room also allows for, for, for this sort of play, right? So you're no longer a part of the main story. And that's when you can sort of break characters, just do these fun community things. Frankly, really like sort of conference style things, which is still super fun while you're still, while you're still in the space. And you're doing it with friends, new and old, that you've met on the, on the cruise itself. It's, it's literally the best thing to do to decompress. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that space was there. Frankly, I think I could have, Honestly, what, what do you think, Alex? Do you think there was the right amount of time for decompression? Or do you think we could have used more time or less time? For me, it was perfect. Like, I, I was really happy to stay up um, super late chatting with everyone as long as I could. I, I got to hang out with a bunch of people who I was, like, curious about the entire experience. But they seemed, like, so in characters, like, so much more than me that I was almost afraid to, to break that or invade that in any kind of way. So when some of those people relaxed a little bit, it was really cool to hear about, like, you know, what they do for a living and uh, and what why Star Wars is so meaningful to them and why immersive experiences are a place where they feel like they can really express themselves. And uh, I thought with afterwards, there was a Facebook group specifically for people who were on the July 8th, 9th, 10th experience. There's uh, a Discord That's channel insane. where people keep this going. Um, it is interesting to note that there's no official like offboarding from Disney. There's no like real follow-up email or anything that tries to um, keep all of you together. But there is a nice community push for people to stay in touch and remember that they shared this special experience together. And even though I barely use uh, Facebook at all, probably there's five or six people um, from this experience who I met on the cruise. And I'm still, you know, chatting with a little bit about Star Wars things, but also totally random things as well. We met people who are also game designers, experienced designers, working in VR, working in uh, all sorts of other related fields that interest us as well. Wow. All right. Okay, guys. I I feel like we're, we're at a good point. I, I have some questions for both of you. All right? <laughs> Let's do it. The first one is, did you feel like the amount of time you had there was the 
and not just this last little bit, but the whole thing. Do you feel like the amount of time you had there was the right amount of time? Or do you wish it had gone longer? Do you wish it had been shorter? For me, we're not I taking feel... money out of the equation here. We're just talking about the yeah. experience itself. So I felt that it could have they could have done, they could have used an additional day with the same amount of activity to allow for gaps of rest and exploration. Um, again, if money was not, you know, part of, part of the equation, right. I think, I think there was a lot that was happening in the two and a half days that we were there that it's, I can see why people would be overwhelmed. Like I, I love doing these things, but even I got really tired. Um, that said though, I can see also value for them packing everything the way they did, because that allowed for the density of interaction that made it so magical. So Man, I, I'm going to give you a cop on answer where, like, I kind of wish I had one more day, but I also am glad it was just two and a half days. All right. Alex? Yeah. It felt really good to me. It felt like the right amount of time. Um, there were a couple of lulls where, like, I felt like there wasn't quite enough for me to do, and, and I wanted uh, actually more activity, which might sound counterintuitive, um, but I... I was looking for any reason to stay as immersed as possible and not be left to my own thoughts and start thinking about like what I need to do, you know, for work to catch up on my job when I get home or anything like that. Um, so the, the amount of time ultimately ended up being perfect for me. It felt like a charrette. Um, oh, and by the way, I, I did find the German word we were looking for. Uh, Gesam Kunstwerk, <laughs> which is the ah, German term that translates as total work of art and describes artwork design or creative process we're different art for me to create a single cohesive whole. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly. Gesam Kunstwerk. And uh, that is absolutely what this experience was. The architecture, the music, the acting, the pacing of the whole story. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Um, I asked you a specific question. We, we can get to your, uh, to, to <laughs> your overview here at the end. All right, all right. We, we, gotta, we gotta- I just really wanted to remember this. that German word. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So David, maybe an extra day, who knows? Maybe, maybe not. Alex, pretty good. All right. Now, oh, throwing it back to David, I want like out of this whole experience, what was your highlight and what was like the one thing that you wish had not happened during that time? Hmm. Okay, I'm going to answer the last one, last question first, because that's easy. I, 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 don't, I cannot think of one. I think everything happened perfectly and for a reason. And I was glad that everything happened the way they did. If I had to nitpick, I mean, this is not something that was within their control. I mean, obviously, the, the shuttle back from Batu could have been a shuttle and not the bus. But honestly, as designer Dave, I was glad I saw the behind the scenes. So actually, I wouldn't have touched that. Now, the, the first question, man, like the highlight, that's hard to pick. But um, I keep going back to Lenka Mock and a little Lenka because it's just such an emotionally moving thing for me. I, I love it when I see little kids sort of like um, see themselves represented in characters. And I love seeing a change um, visibly in my very eye in front of me. Like I watched a shy girl become a not shy girl. Yeah. So so, so, so that, that for me was actually personally super moving. Um, and the fact that a fantasy world and a wonderful cast member did that just made it all more worthwhile. And keep in mind, this is in the, already the backdrop of a wonderful experience that everyone else is having. Like, the entire space of people are, are having, right? So, but that is memorable for me. I will never forget that from this experience. Yeah, wow. All right, that those are some some good thoughts there, Alex. Uh, give yeah. me your highlight, low light. What happened? Uh, a highlight for me was definitely um, one of the first interactions that I had with Lieutenant Croy, where he absolutely felt like a scary first order official. Um, and again, like I, I fortunately have never encountered a real world equivalent of someone like this. And so to have this moment of like trying to confront something that on some visceral level was a little bit frightening to me and to find a way to actually like form a relationship here that was both like dangerous but also very friendly and warm and welcoming and to actually make him crack up when i got to tell him the story of like why i was wearing an arkina 5 prison uniform um that felt really good that was like this really perfect like unique moment that i wouldn't 
change anything about that sold me on like, I want to be helping the first order for the rest of this whole experience. Um, so that, that initial interaction and how that carried through the whole experience was very cool. Um, one of the only critiques I had, it was actually something Kevin Labson brought up, but I, I was like, yeah, that wouldn't have been that hard to do. Um, you never necessarily feel like you are on a spaceship and an easy oh, way right. to, well, you do, you do visually, but Kevin brought up the notion that like, when you go to hyperspace, when there's like blasters hitting the the ship or something like that, like if you just had like subwoofers, like some kind of haptic or something to just kind of make the place vibrate a little bit, um, that would have been a pretty low cost way to just give you a little bit more of a sense of like, oh my God, crazy things are happening. And, uh, and as soon as he mentioned that, I became very aware of like just how still everything was, um, even when the whole ship should have been shaking. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thought we we're talking about low lights, but if we're talking about criticism. <laughs> oh boy, I think, I think, I think, I think we have definitely have a lot of things to, to talk about there. But I, well, just pointing uh, it out. Okay, have to go uh, there. Uh, let, let's get back <laughs> to that. I think. Oh, you want to hear it? Like additional improvements that I think. Like I, I got, I got one, I got one question, <laughs> and then we, can, then we can get there. All right. We don't have to. We don't have to. I no, like I, I, I want. I, I think folks would love to hear more about, like, just, it just we'll get there. All right. Okay. The, the the question I think that's on a lot of people's mind, certainly on my mind, given all the feedback, was, I was it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Should I go first? Yeah. All right. So here's it's a really complicated question. So, is it worth it? Probably not. Is it worth seven thousand five hundred dollars for five people to go through it? Probably not, <laughs> because that 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 you know I, that's going through a typical de definition of value, which is you, you compare it to something else that you would do. So, what's the opportunity cost of seven thousand five hundred dollars? Probably a really nice vacation uh, in the Cayman Islands somewhere. Um, is it compared to that? Probably not. But and I, I think I think many many other other podcasts say this like. You know, if you quantify value that way, it's it's never gonna be worth it. But if you if, if you quantify it in a, in a sense where like, does it allow you to fulfill an escapist fantasy of being the Star Wars universe? Then that's kind of priceless, right? That's that that's kind of like you know that's that uh, there are many people who pay a lot a lot of money for that. Now, the experience we went through, it was absolutely like I can see why it costs that much. So it's not like they're trying to milk you for money. Like it literally costs that much to, to, to make it run. So I don't fault it for costing that much. I think I think there's a whole other conversation we can, de can definitely have about the the, the, the the unit economics of whether or not this is actually a a, a revenue, you know, a rev a rev revenue cent positive business that um for a variety of reasons I I I can see why it's not, right? Like it's it's a very expensive thing to run. And only a very small niche group of people want to go for it. And I think therein lies the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Alex, thoughts? Well put, David. Um, so for me, absolutely, it was worth it. Um, I was not looking for a little Star Wars escapist fantasy. That isn't something I've been dreaming about since I was a kid. Uh, again, I always liked Star Wars. It was never like my favorite thing in the world. Um, Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings, like maybe this is something that I would actually pay just to pretend that I'm, I'm in that world for a little while. Uh, why it was worth it for me is because there are things that I, I take from this that are going to affect my work and my company's work. Uh, I've talked a lot to, to other people, I don't think ever on this podcast, but about how transformative my time studying abroad in London was in 2008 because I saw so many theater pieces that elevated the art form of theater to me from something that is uh, frivolous and a fun little side thing that's ultimately kind of forgettable to something that can like shake the core values of a person because that happened to me quite a few times over that one semester. And I, I realized the power that theater could have. Um, this experience was, was up there with that level of catharsis and understanding the power of theater, not proscenium theater with a, a fourth wall, um, not even immersive theater like I've experienced it before with Immersive Gatsby or Sleep No More or um, The Highwaymen or any of the other immersive experiences I've seen that typically just last a couple hours. But this was a more 
complete kind of immersive theater and immersion than anything I've ever seen before, including VR, including yeah. anything else. And by far. And and what I want to take from this is is lessons that can go into other work because yes this this, something at this scale something over this length of time that's something that does require a huge budget and the ambition of you know a company like disney um but there are so many little lessons here in in how um an audience and an actor engage and how you um make people feel welcomed and cared for and special that I think will make its way into our virtual reality experiences, into how we design um, all sorts of different work that uh, the thing I'm kind of coming to here is like, I think a a show like this kind of teaches you how to be a better person. And uh, we talked to one of the creators who talked about how something like this, ultimately immersive theater at this uh, level of quality can hopefully start to cure what, what we refer to as like the epidemic of loneliness in the world because it just teaches you to care more. It teaches you to look at that person across from you who looks like they're having a bummer day and not just want to ignore them, but be kind of wondering, like, I wonder if there's anything I can do to help. Um, that's kind of the ethos of all this. Everyone is listening. They're not just talking. And everyone is trying to find ways to make this a more enjoyable experience, not just for themselves, not just me, 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 but for everyone around them. Yeah, wow. Well, Matt, you nailed it, Alex. I just, I, mean, I just want to add, like, it makes me super sad that I don't think we'll ever see anything else like this. It, it takes a level of ambition, and a level of budget to pull off what they did. Yeah, it's incredible what they pulled off, and it just shits me that that the economics just don't work out, right? Like it, it, it's, I don't know how they could pull off what they did, the magic that they pulled off, the the mechanics that they used, the the, the level of detail and design that they use without spending and costing this amount of money. Yeah. So it makes me sad that we won't see anything else like it for a long, long, long time. Yeah, I, but that said, all the lessons, all the lessons that we learn from it are, 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 are going to inform so many more amazing experiences in the future, but just, I don't think there'll be anything like this. Yeah. yeah I, so I, I, I want to kind of, and also because we're, you know, <laughs> already running into a very long part two here, but I, I want us to kind of, roll into some closing thoughts here but if i can i i want to try and and put my spin on what i've heard so far from you guys having given this you know had this experience you know i sir i i I think it's it's always fascinating to hear from other people's points of view the kinds of experiences that really capture them right And, and it's it's been clear from you know the very start that both of you were very much in obviously you came into it with some level of investment right this was an exciting thing and you know from the start you knew you were in for something special right um but it seems that like this was the kind of experience where it didn't matter what kind of person you were like you were telling the story about the little girl we were telling stories about you know caring and empathizing all these other things you can come into this with any expectation and walk out of it feeling as if you have, you know, gained not just like some, you know, story in your back pocket. You didn't just go see a movie or, you know, capture that little moment of, you know, uh, you know, living another life that I think a a lot of folks look, look for when it comes to uh, not just, you know, uh, um, a story, but an immersive, you know, something that really, captures you this seems like it did that in spades and and it's really exciting to hear and also just how clever it is right and just how many different little beats there are how it it sounded like everything was very much complete um and i i actually kind of want to touch in on on what you were just saying there david where you're saying well i i don't know if we're going to experience something like this and while obviously i hope that you know, for my sake, selfishly, I, I hope something like this exists, or maybe they decide not to close it and revamp the script. So I haven't heard the whole thing. But in any case, I actually think what we saw here was really more or less a prototype of, of the sorts of things that you know we've been imagining in the world of. Yeah, you know, I'm going to relate this back to a, a immersive, you know, technology in general. Right. Like, yes, of course, this was an in-person 
this was a very physical, very, you know, kind of print experience, right? And the question is like, with so much of what we do in, you know, historically in like AR, VR, what, you know, what people kind of think of in, in technology is so separate still from the kinds of experiences we're talking about here. You know, the tangible, the like the food was great, you know, <laughs> people were there to care for me, right? Like these are not things you hear about in, in technology, right? Um, what excites me though, is that I, I, I think there is somewhat of an agreement in the vision of, of where people want, you know, that technology to go. I, I'm not going to be cliche and, and talk through all the, you know, Ready Player One-esque examples, right? But, but I think there is an opportunity in the future for more people to experience this. And I, I, I think that's a great thing, right? Like this, I actually think, is more or less a prototype for Disney and for a lot of other people who saw this as we're going to go out, we're just going to build this thing. Everyone's going to call us crazy. And people did call them crazy, <laughs> right? We're just going to build it and see who comes and see if it works, right? And I, I, I think in that sense, in the sense that, yes, we'll probably never get a chance to go back on that ship and experience the the, the passion and, and the... The, the level of detail that you guys experience, I do think actually this will be a prototype for what we will see and what will come out of it, which might not look the same, but hopefully, honestly, might be a little more accessible and yeah, maybe yeah. more affordable as a result, right? It has to be. The hope. Exactly. Exactly. Everything you said plus one, sir. Yeah. I have faith. I have faith that 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 the more more amazing things will come out of this it will not be this no but it will likely be, learn from this sorry go ahead the, the goal is to normalize this we want this to feel like not this crazy thing that someone needs to you know save up five years of income in order to go see yeah. but something that they might go do every friday night with a group of their friends or to meet someone new or whatever so to see this proliferate more um you know people have been talking with uh is gonna be it's gonna feel like this is a, a total tangent but it's not the Apple Vision Pro, and people are like, oh, hey, why does the Apple Vision Pro not do like all the crazy things you can do with uh, spatial computing? Why is it starting by just having like 2D apps, you know, up in space? And people talk about the conceptual ladder and this idea that you need to like gradually introduce new things to people so they feel comfortable with it. And I've been talking to people about that sort of thing for a long time with, you know, a VR theater experience and how do you take someone who understands what a sit down proscenium theater experiences and start to open them up to the possibilities of VR. Similarly here, this is uh, an immersive theater experience that works very hard to make this feel comfortable if you've never been on a cruise ship, don't know Star Wars that well, uh, have never done immersive theater, and walks you through all this. Now, the more people become familiar and comfortable with something like this, the, the, the more or the higher up that conceptual ladder we can start to be, and the more we can start to do things that are really um, pushing the envelope and uh, because it feels more normal, you know, it's back to talking about like why films look so different now from how they did in the 1920s and the development of the cinematic language and why apps have changed so much since the advent of the initial app store or websites, et cetera, et cetera. But the hope is that the children who have seen this, uh, the designers who have seen this, the people like yourself and hopefully our listeners who are taking some little seeds of knowledge away from this, that little sparks are going to form that start to influence their work. And some of these elements start to permeate uh, other art forms, other things we might call immersive theater, other immersive works of other kinds like VR and AR. Um, and this all just starts to feel more normal. So we get more creative people creating more meaningful work that connects people, that gives people a sense of empathy, of love, of, of you know, community. And, uh, and hopefully it makes the world a better place. Gosh darn it. Man, I, I, I love everything you just said, Alex. And I just want to expand by saying, like, look, this thing, this beautiful, beautiful, ambitious, expensive thing we call the Galactic Star Cruiser, it showed that entertainment is still rife for inventing. Yeah. It showed that we could sort of build new ways of entertaining people that could connect and and emotionally affect you in still ways that I think many of us did not, did, did not expect. And that is the hopeful, hopeful message that I want to take away from this, which is, like, people are going to learn how to do that in better and more amazing ways. 
because man, we still have so much more new media to invent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I it it yeah. Th this seems so unique, but yet, I, I I guess a bit of this says to me, like, man, this this seems like only the start, right? Like this was a small space. You, it was not many rooms, as you guys said. Yes, there were a lot of cast. There was a lot of moments and there was a lot of work that went into this, right? But it seems like just the start. Like there seems like so much more that you could do with this concept in such a in a, a much broader fashion, right? I mean, think about what Alex just said like, "Oh man, what would I pay to just be in Lord of the Rings for?" Okay, yeah. right? Well, you can go to New Zealand. That's beside the point. But I, I, I think this really is, to some extent, scratching the surface, right? Um, I don't know. How did, how did you guys feel? Yeah, it's a start. It's the start of something yeah. that I hope we'll all look back on as, um, you know, like an early Eisenstein film or something like that. This is the beginning of, of montage or something like that. And we can point to this in the same way people talk about Sleep No More right now as a certain kind of ground zero or at least benchmark along this continuum of um, new forms of narrative. No. Nodding and nodding. <laughs> That's all I have to say. All right. Well, we should wrap it up here because we have had a wonderful time speaking about this any closing final final thoughts the two of you guys haven't haven't taken this voyage in batu and florida and wherever else um i'll just mention that we all had really rough times getting home uh and it was still totally worth it all, all of us were having like weird problems yes. with delayed flights things were getting canceled Gosh. and yet um, I just sat there the whole time while all this nonsense was happening saying, it's okay. It's totally okay. Uh, I'm still processing this incredible journey I've been on and uh, I'm, I'm not bothered <laughs> at all. So well, it's I think crazy it volumes like, about the experience that it was that good. Yeah. We had crazy delayed flights. Like I think some of us were on the tarmac. Like I was on my plane on tarmac for like, three and a half hours. Like it was a terrible, terrible. And we were delayed at least six hours each for our flights. But yet, yeah, it was still a blast. I'll do it all over again even with the shitty planes. Um, I do want to say one thing though. Like I think I've said it, I said it earlier. I, I want to say it again. I just cannot stress how awesome the blue shirts were. Mm -hmm. um, it's such, such that I think, you know, we, we, we wrote an email to Disney at the very end of it, just sort of highlighting the names and, 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 and Disney actually replied with a phone call and left a voicemail, just thanking us for that, for that, for that email. So I just want to say on this podcast, if you don't mind, but Holy crap, Audra, Man, we love your cocktail yeah. service. I, I, Audra is amazing. You are so cool. Stefan also, um, our cocktail server. Sam, our dinner server, was super amazing. He made everything so much funnier, all the food he brought out. Crystal, who also was the bartender at the lounge, she remembered all the drinks we loved. Molly, who remembered all our names as she got it to our rooms. Bookended the and beginning and the end of the experience. Exactly. beginning and, the end. and this is just on top of all the fantastic, fantastic performers who played Wraith. Lenka, uh, Croy, and, and Sammy, and 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 obviously all the people masks as well. But it's, it's just the people made it, man. It was such a good experience. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Well, if you've listened up to this point, and I hope you have, because I think this one gets better with age. You know, uh, make sure you like. Make sure you comment. Let us know. Did you enjoy this? Do you want us to, to, hey, look, if, if, if you want us to put up some merch so we can do more cool experiences, I mean, I, I get it. I'll get invited <laughs> next time and, you know, I'll, I'll leave these two out of it. But if you're interested, <laughs> let us know in the comments and maybe we can work something out. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this. And Alex, I guess we'll see them on the next episode. Yeah, coming up, uh, we'll be recapping VR Toronto. Um, we'll be talking about uh, some really cool in-world AI, Unreal Engine stuff. And, and again, I just want to give a little call to action for anyone who 
has done the Star Cruiser experience or is fascinated in everything we've just been describing, um, I am happy to share all my my 3D models and you know certain photos and all that. If anyone wants to be part of a, a bit of a community project to try to create an archive of this experience. You know, maybe we can get um, some good 3D models of the entire Halcyon experience. The sad thing is that as far as we know, once that shuts down in September, it's not going to be able to be used for anything else because of some weird like tax burden kind of things. Um, so being able to preserve this in some kind of way, uh, I think would be quite nice. Uh, certainly trying to capture the essence or the spirit of some of these characters uh, would be quite cool. And uh, and even if it's just something that that people want to uh, look at from um, from a 3D model perspective, even if we don't try to capture the experience itself, it's it's the kind of thing that I think will evoke a lot of exciting uh, memories and ideas and and uh, inspiration for people. So, you know, this isn't something that like I'm I'm actively pursuing at the moment, but I think if enough of us kind of say like, yeah, I'd like to spend some time modeling that Sabak table in, in 3D or something like that, um, that would be kind of a cool group effort. So I'll, I'll put that out there to the world. <laughs> so long, farewell. And thank you, David, for uh, being our guest. Uh, thanks to Alan for uh, being our producer. Thanks to uh, Vikas for giving us this wonderful studio to play in. And he is now on vacation. And we appreciate him setting up this, being here for part <laughs> one, and then uh, flying off to, uh, to do his thing on a much deserved break. So yes, thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you next time. Thank you, gents, for having me on your show.